Good evening, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started for Bible study tonight. I'm standing in for my dad here for a little while. Um, as per him, tonight uh, I have some things on Sodom and Gomorrah. I made comments the other day that I couldn't back up very well, so I did some studying over the last couple of days, and I've got a little presentation for you guys. Um, and then there's a little bit left over on Korah, where he left off the other day. We'll run through that, and uh, for most of that, I'll probably just pass it off to my grandpa. He's got some stuff prepared, and then we'll go through the questions on Sunday. Uh, before we get started, we'll start with a word of prayer. Gary Jr., do you mind wording that for us? Thank you, Father. Uh, we're all being blessed this evening. We have come together with my word of prayer. We thank you, Father, for the people we're at, the whole team, because if they're worth the coming, you we ask you, Father, we have a God in our lives, we will not turn to the world, but turn to our work to God. We ask you to be Amen. All right. So most of you guys already know we're going through the book of Jude right now. And there's a portion of Jude that mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's very small. And we talked about it for a few moments the other day. And it was brought up that we don't know where Sodom and Gomorrah was. That's how wiped out it was after God, you know, sought his wrath on, on those two evil cities. Um, and, and I mentioned this in a sermon I preached a little while back. That book I've got, this kind of looks like part of the picture. That's not a laser. That's a laser. Uh, that, that is actually the cover of the book uh, called Is Atheism Dead by Eric Metaxas? And there's a whole chapter on Sodom and Gomorrah, and I read it about four times last night. And I will try my best to pull as much of that out as I can. Uh, if you're going to venture into that book, I strongly encourage you to. It is very dense. <laughs> it's not light reading, and it's not something you'll be able to just pick up. But it is one of the most compelling pieces of, of um theologic writing outside of the Bible I've ever come across. So I really encourage you, and it's it's very Bible-centered. Uh, I've yet to come across something that I feel like goes outside the Bible. Now, there's a lot of uh, outside additives to it, which is the whole point of the book. The whole point of the book is confirming Christianity, confirming the Bible with research, um, a little bit of ideology, um, but there's three main chapters, and the first two are the ones that hit, or three main uh section segments of the book the first one being uh science and astronomy uh, is a big piece of that one and the second one being archaeology so obviously sodom comes in the archaeology portion uh so this chapter talks about this guy named dr collins uh dr I wrote his name down somewhere else stephen collins is his name um as far as his christian background i can't tell you what what church he claims, what denomination he claims to be a part of. But as much as, as, as this guy, Eric Metaxas, talks about this archaeologist, very devout Christian and someone who takes the Bible very seriously and very literally. And that was the problem that he found with a lot of these archaeological digs that have been done. Um, and so for a long time, starting um, post-World War II, going clear up until about 1996, which is when this guy first kind of started his journey, uh, it was thought that the same thing I said last week, I actually misspoke when I said where I thought it was, that Sodom and Gomorrah was somewhere on the south side of the Dead Sea, in this big circle, right? And they had the idea that um, it was there, God wiped it out, the water levels kind of ro rose and sank, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself, I know this, I had this written somewhere, um, but the, the, the water levels probably rose to the point to where the actual quote-unquote burial site of Sodom and Gomorrah is underwater. It sank like Atlantis, right? That was kind of the idea. They just kind of taken that at face value. They found plenty of ruins that maybe kind of sort of lined up, and then that was just kind of good enough, right? Because the biggest reason for believing that was this is where two tectonic plates meet, and, and it's quite common and quite logical that uh, geological events happen in this area. Right. So they found traces of magma and gas and explosions and things that would line up with what we believe the fire and brimstone, or we read rather, about the fire and brimstone that is talked about in, in Genesis, where he's talking about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. But all of the thoughts that's probably going through each and every one of your mind right now is that's not what God said. Right. He didn't say that the stuff came up out of the ground. Right. 
he said that it rained down from the sky. And, and Dr. Collins took that quite literally. And he said, that's, I, I can't take that at face value because it doesn't match, right? It, if it actually was an earthquake, why doesn't the Bible say it was an earthquake? Like, for example, uh, we know that Paul, when he was in prison, he experienced an earthquake, right? So they knew what earthquakes were back then. If it was an earthquake, why, did it, why didn't it say earthquake? Why did it say that God rained fire down from the sky? So that was a lot of the thoughts in Dr. Collins' mind uh, when he was kind of setting out on his venture here. And a lot of those things that I just said, I'll touch on again. I'm, uh, I know I'm getting kind of out of order here, but logically that's kind of how the chapter flows through. So again, decades, it was accepted that this was the general idea, the general area for where Sodom and Gomorrah could and should be located. Uh, the two tectonic plates meet here, magma, gas, all the things that kind of line up with the way that we think about Sodom and Gomorrah. But again, he questioned this because it doesn't line up with Genesis. It's not what the Bible says, right? So he, uh, he kind of set out onto this this, this quest for finding the actual Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he, he had some ideas in his mind as to why this area right here is not where Sodom and Gomorrah is or, or shouldn't be, right? Um, again, the volcanic gas and the mass that comes from the ground uh, comes out of the ground, not from the sky, right? The scientific and, and the retroactive dating that they do on these volcanic rocks and lava and magma and the things that they're actually looking at that they're quoting or, or uh, perplexing that it could be Sodom and Gomorrah doesn't line up, right? So they're doing some radioactive dating and they're lining it to be about uh, 2350 BC, which is about five to 700 years before Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were wiped out according to our biblical timelines, right? Our biblical timeline estimates that it should be about 1700 BC. And from what we can date with these with this area, with the, the geological events in this area, they don't line up, right? Whatever happened here happened about five or six or 700 years before Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So there's problem number one. Uh, problem number two was it the, the biblical account, right? So we talked about the fire in the sky. We talked about, I'm just gonna leave the map up because it's a lot easier to look at the map. Um, <clears throat> the, the Bible talks about the fire in the sky. It doesn't say anything about earthquakes. Again, it mentions earthquakes elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, so that, that just doesn't match up one-to-one, -one, right? You can kind of put it in the same box. You can kind of fit, the, fit it in the puzzle somewhere, but it doesn't fit as a puzzle piece, right? Another big one was when it's talking about Abraham's account of Sodom and Gomorrah. From where Abraham was positioned, he could see the smoke from miles away, right? The Genesis refers to it as the, the fire and the smoke of a chimney. He could see it from 40 miles away. Um, and, and really with the geography, you can see here that this is a really mountainous area, right? So if Sodom and Gomorrah is on top of this mountain on the left side, not in the pink, but over in the brown, they kind of estimated right where the arrow points, kind of in this area that you know, perhaps if it was on top of a mountain, he could see it coming off the top of the mountain. But from the positioning, it just didn't make sense. That there's not really anywhere Abraham could be. Specifically, Abraham was to the west, right? If he was on the other side of this mountain range, he couldn't and shouldn't have been able to see that big pillar of fire or pillar of cloud, the smoke coming off of it like a furnace. So that one didn't make sense either, right? And again, Dr. Collins is really taking literally what we read here in Genesis. Um, so these are kind of the reasons that he's arguing against what, what had been uh, understood for years and years and years. So here's the biggest one. Uh, they they kind of had to make a, a lot of assumptions because all of this area, even as you, you know, most of your lifetimes you've realized, and even in my shorter lifetime, all of this area is under dispute, right? When you pull up Google Maps, it's not a straight line that divides it in half. You got Jordan on one side and Judah on the other side or modern day Israel, right? When you look, there's a big triangle that shoots here through the middle and you've got this disputed area called Palestine. And there's a big swath in the middle of Jerusalem that's cut in half that they don't, Google won't say who owns it, right? Because that's a political stance and, and Google won't make a political stance. So even now, even though it's settled down a lot more, um, this stuff's been under dispute since, you know, before World War II, but definitely clear up 1960 through 1990, it's just hard to excavate because you, there's a lot, there's too much politics involved, right? And that, that's the worst part about science is when politics get involved, you can't, do pure science. You can't perform things the way you know you should. You just do what you can, right? So these are the four biggest problems that really he was kind of presenting. Pardon me. <clears throat> so back to the Dead Sea. I talked about how they talked about um, essentially Sodom and or Sodom and Gomorrah sank like Atlantis, right? They just went clean out of sight. 
God smashed them to bits and then the Dead Sea rose and then that's why we can't find it anymore. And again, for him, his first argument was, that's eh, a cheap shot. That's a cheap answer. You know, we can't find it because it's gone and it sank and that's not very fulfilling, right? He didn't like that answer because it wasn't fulfilling. And we didn't really have a good reason to say that, right? And his biggest argument against this was that we know from history and from the water levels of the Dead Sea that the lowest the Dead Sea ever was was in the time of Abraham's day, right? And never got any lower, which that would kind of help you make the argument for if the Dead Sea rose, it could have risen up around that smoldering Sodom and Gomorrah. But we also know that it really hasn't risen that much at all, right? Not enough to swallow a city whole and not enough that like mythical Atlantis, it sank to the bottom of the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right? So it's just, it's not really possible because the, the level of the Dead Sea's not changed that much in the last eight, nine, ten thousand years. It just hasn't happened. Um, so... Reading in Genesis 13, as, as this guy quoted, um, I, I'm going to go through that here in the next uh, couple slides. We will read several portions of Genesis 13. But uh, Genesis 13 summarizes Lot and Abraham's travel, right? And as Lot and Abraham are, are leaving, they're leaving from Egypt, right? Egypt, if, it's not on this map, but if you guys have any idea of this portion of the world, Egypt's kind of down over here by me. Um, across the peninsula down here, across the, the uh, Red Sea, where Moses crossed, is down here by the back of the street. And they moved up from Egypt and they started heading north, right? That's the biggest idea. They knew they were south and they started heading north, right? And it references the Dead Sea. It references uh, Jerusalem, which was still there, right? And it really didn't make sense because if they're talking about Jerusalem, they're talking about the water. And they stopped before they even got to the water. How, that, that doesn't make sense, right? How could they have gotten to Jerusalem if, if Lot was parked at Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah is backwards, right? It doesn't say anything about Lot backtracking. So that was his, his next biggest argument as for why it didn't line up was because it didn't match the biblical record, right? And it's uh, the, God made a point of making sure that was in the Bible to talk about their, their travels, their direction, how they were going to move. And it said that they traveled north through the Negev Desert, which I'll show here in a moment or two. And they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, right? And then this is where they started to have their little disputes, right? Their families, their herds, their helpers, they all got so big that they started to fight. And that's when Abraham says, let's go ahead and split, right? So they, the plan was not to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. The plan was just the camp. That's where they got. And they couldn't stay where they were, so they had to split, right? So where they were before they split was between Bethel and Ai. Again, kind of ancient city, so it's hard to reference. And a lot of this is modern day, is in Arabic, right? The, the city names didn't transfer, didn't translate all, all uh, down to the line. But we know that Bethel and Ai are north of Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is still there, so we can use it as a reference point. We know they were heading toward Jerusalem. They were past Jerusalem, and then that, that still doesn't make sense, right? How, how did Lot end up at the bottom if they started way down here, went clear up to Jerusalem, and then Lot and Abraham split, right? He wouldn't have gone backwards. He would have kept on heading. So let's read uh, Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. <clears throat> Anybody care to read? <laughs> Go ahead. Let's read, read through verse 6 for me. Very good. So this is kind of where Dr. Collins makes his first postulation, right? So we, we, we have pretty good biblical record here of what happened between Abraham and Lot, which is what's important, right? Sodom and Gomorrah weren't really even necessarily involved in the Bible at all until Lot got there, right? Lot and Abraham are our main characters. We're following these guys along their journey, and then we're just trying to figure out where they're at in reference, right? Because it all makes a lot more sense if you have an idea of where they are, what's going on, just like following Paul through his biblical journeys, or if you want to use an outside example, right? The Lord of the Rings books comes with a map, right? He made up all this stuff, but he drew a map because it's a little easier to understand. It, it, understand, explain, two words, sorry. I'm going a little faster than my brain. 
Um, so here's his postulation, right? So here's the the, uh, the ancient cities, Bethel up on top, AI really close together, right? So that's where they made their camp between these two cities. And they're close enough that it makes sense, right? He didn't say it was beside Bethel. He didn't say it was beside AI. If those were on either side of Israel, then, you know, that, those aren't very good reference points. These two cities are right together. So that gives us a really good spot, right? They weren't in a town. They weren't in a city. They were kind of in their own little tiny wilderness or farm or whatever you want to call it. They had their own big herds. They had their families and they had room to do stuff. But there's only so much room between these two little towns, right? So they know where they are. And they, as, as we keep on reading, we know what they decide to do with their little interaction, right? Abraham says, Lot, where do you want to go? And Lot says these words, right? Jeff, you want to read from there? The, uh, you, can, you can start in seven or, or ten is really where it's important. And Lot showed them all the plain of the Lord, and Lot turned east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the city of the plain, pitched his tent toward the far. But the men of far, wicked, sinners toward the Lord, and The Lord said unto Abram, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, look to the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. That's good right there. You can stop right there. Thank you. Um, so the part, part that I want to focus on right there where you read is, so it talks about how Lot moved, right? Lot looked up his eyes from where they were, and... He said, where do I want to go? Lot, uh, Abraham asked him that, right? Or Abram at this time, his name still was. And from the geography, right? The, ge the ge geology, the geography, the topography, whichever words you want to insert here, all three of the above, there's really only one way that Lot could have looked. And it mentions that he looked eastward here, which is important, right? If we go back to our last slide here, when we say that Lot was looking eastward, they would have had to have been way, way, way south of Jerusalem, right? And it mentions that um, Abraham, excuse me, Abram and Lot had headed clear up to Jerusalem. They set up their camp. And then from that camp, they're looking eastward, right? So if, if he's looking east of Jerusalem, right, or thereabouts, which is where we think Bethel and Ai are, it's got to be somewhere on this right side, okay? And so if they're south of it, looking eastward, they're looking into the Dead Sea. And way down here, it just doesn't make sense because there's nothing eastward to see. The only thing eastward to see of this plain over here is a big mountain range, right? So from that, logic from that idea and especially since we know he was between Bethel and Ai which again on my next note back one right there are up on top of that hill right back and forth there's Jerusalem Bethel and Ai are up there and you can see these mountain ranges they're up on top of the mountain and he looks out toward Jericho right and so this is where uh they had to insert a lot of uh, of culture understanding and translations of words uh clear down through arabic and it was it was only, it was even hard for me to uh to hang on to um so i'm going to abbreviate this as fast as i can essentially i think they pull a word out of the bible um and they referenced the the land that lot was looking at and they called it uh a version of unleavened bread right and they translated that into the arabic and they called it essentially uh that same kind of bread but it was a circle right and the idea was that bread was unleavened bread it was a circle of unleavened bread aka really flat ground in a big circle so lot was looking out he sees a big giant circle of flat ground from on top of the mountain where abraham and he are standing and the only place that that can possibly be is straight over crossed straight across, I'm making so many words up today, straight across this big flat area to the east, west toward the United States to my left, east toward Japan to my right. So from that idea, they limited the place where they could look for Sodom and Gomorrah. This is how they decided to 
where to excavate, essentially. Um, there's a really good map in the book. Kindle does not allow me to copy and paste, so I couldn't pull it out no matter how hard I tried. Um, I'll try harder some other time. <laughs> um, essentially, it's the same idea right here, that same flat circle. And Dr. Collins, what he did is he found these little individual sites in there. I believe there were 14 of them. And what they all translated to were tells, right? Or tall, I think was the word in Arabic, right? And in Arabic, that tall translates to mound. And they use that word over and over again. We would understand it like the name Tel Aviv, right? Everybody's heard of Tel Aviv as a town in Israel to this day, modern day Israel, right? It's not as old as these cities. But he found all these different little tells and they all fell inside this circle of bread or the flat circle area that Lot was looking at in Genesis chapter 13 here. Um, the 14 different mound locations were located in what they eventually just referred to as the circular plane, right? Or this flat piece of unleavened bread or how whatever kind of analogies passed down through the, the languages and the, the scriptures and, and the understandings. And some of them have been exca excavated, some of them had not, right? Uh, a very, very prominent one had not, and I'll talk about why it had not. Um, there was a really important one that had been excavated called the Tal Nimrim, the Tal Nimrim, and that was kind of on the eastern edge, right about there, if I can hold my dot steady. Um, it had been excavated and they found artifacts that kind of line, lined up with that era, right? One really important thing was they were clearly able to tell based on the dating of these artifacts. Dr. Collins himself his specialty is in dating of pottery, right? There, there was a word for that. I don't even remember what it was, but that was his job. He could look at a piece of pottery and tell you what year this was from. Um, and specifically on his work and work that had done, been done before he got there, they could see that there was a 500 year gap where nothing existed there. They found stuff from what they called the Middle Bronze Age. Nothing existed during the Late Bronze Age. And after that, they started finding stuff again. That's an interesting thought. It didn't really register to them a whole lot until they started digging up the other one. Um, the Well, they, they actually, I think they excavated all of them except for this one. I think they saved it for last. I don't know if that was for dramatic effect or what. Um, but the last one they excavated was called the Tal El Hamam. Okay, so we're getting into some uh, Arabic and Muslim sounding words here. But that's what it's called. The, uh, now, the tall El Hamam, right? And, and what happened was they crested the hill here. I got to go back to my map. I should have put a map on every slide. Um, they crested the hill, standing up on top, started going down the hill, and they hit this valley over here, right where the sea is in Jericho. And he looked at it, and he said it looked like a ship in the middle of a field. This, this tall or tell or whatever... Uh, translation you want to use for the word mound, right? In my mind, I keep thinking Indian mound because that's the only thing we have around here. Like when you go down to Moundsville, the, the Indian mound of Moundsville, it, it doesn't blend in. You know, it's not, not supposed to be there. It's different than the rest of the hills, right? We've got rolling hills around here and everything blends together, but th that's clearly different, right? Over in Lower City, right beside my grandma's house down on the bottom, her, her neighbor's house is built on top of an Indian mound. She lives down in the bottom and her, it, it's literally looks like her house is sitting on top of a traffic cone. You can tell that those things aren't, aren't normal, right? And that's what he said when he saw this thing not only did it look like this big massive ship riding on a sea of field that is quote what he said um it had never been excavated and it was as tall as a nine-story building right uh which is 10 times higher than anything in jerusalem right just for reference because these cities existed at the same time this tell al hamam uh aka all spoiler alert this is sodom right it had structural um, advantage, right? This thing was really tall. It was unlike any other cities around. Uh, it was very fertile, very fruitful, uh, plenty of water, plenty of vegetation, and it just had military and strategy for cities, right? And this was taken advantage of. Another reason why it wasn't excavated. The Ottomans, and then later on the Jordanians, who control most of this area now, again, pink side over in Jordan, they put tanks on top of this thing. They literally would set their tanks on top of there, use it as a mound to patrol the valley, uh, and, and that's why it was never explored because this was, you know, this would be like going down to, to Pearl Harbor and, and, you know, trying to scuba dive, right? It's, it's not something you think about when you're in the middle of a shipyard, uh, tank yard, whatever you want to call it. So that was a, that was a political reason why this had never been excavated, right? So now I can, I can pull up the next map. 
So now we've kind of established, and I will re-elaborate and establish why we think they are, but essentially I can give you an idea of what we're looking at, right? So here's this circular plane that I keep talking about, modern day Kikar. Um, Kikar is a town kind of right over where this dot in Sodom is. Uh, the Dead Sea on the left side here, this circle is the little black circle on the left, and then Sodom and Gomorrah is the little tiny dot right beside it, right? So for reference, this, this thing to the right is tilted to the left a little bit. Both of them are in that circular plane. The one that I have labeled as Gomorrah, the little one, is our Tel Nimrin, and the big one, Sodom, uh, which was the bigger city of the two, uh, not referenced in the Bible, but just from what we've found out in the excavation, um, also why it's a lot more important in literature and why we talk about Sodom versus Sodom and Gomorrah, um, was this Tel Al-Hamal, right? So when they started excav excavating the Tel Al-Hamam, I keep saying Hamal, but it's Hamam, H-A-M-M-A-M, -M -A -M. Um, they found, coincidentally, an absence of pottery from the late Bronze Age. And that sounds familiar, right? That's the same thing that they found back in that tall Nimrin, right? So this guy, uh, Dr. Collins, he started his project officially in 2005. It took him between 1996 and 2005 to narrow all this down. Uh, this guy's from Albuquerque, by the way. So he's flying back and forth all the time. He's an American. Um, he's putting all his effort into this, but it took a lot of research, a lot of biblical knowledge, a lot of understanding, a lot of cooperation to figure out where to go, what's going on, what our options are. And then he had to fight with the politics, right? The Jordanians, the Israelis, nobody wanted him messing around with anywhere because, uh, you know, the, the anybody outside the Judeo or Christian faith really wouldn't want him proving anything to serve the Bible, right? Politically, that's not very advantageous for anybody who's not a Jew or a Christian. Um, so they started digging, right? And, and what I found interesting <laughs> where he just so happened to start digging was a tire track from a tank, right? That had made a big big rut through the middle. And that's where they started. They started digging this kind of linear trench. Uh, initially, I thought he, he did like drill coring, but it was, I should know better with archaeology. Just like this, you see with the dinosaurs, they use paintbrushes to excavate everything, right? So they started digging and nine feet down, they hit an ash-laden, hard-packed layer of soil. This ash-laden layer of soil varied from 18 inches to six feet deep. And they said as soon as they cracked it, as soon as they hit that layer, the smell exploded. It smelled like sulfur. It smelled like the place was on fire, like what we would imagine Pompeii to be like. As soon as they, they hit the quote-unquote pay dirt, which is what they called it, as soon as they hit pay dirt, it smelled like fire. It smelled like ashes, right? So already we're starting to hit buzzers here. <laughs> And the most important part, at least from Dr. Collins' perspective, because he's all about dating, this is his job, the, the artifacts that they started to find lined up with the late, mid, excuse me, the middle Bronze Age, not the late. The late hadn't happened yet, and the late is where stuff was missing. It lined up with a middle Bronze Age estimated to be about 1700 BC. Incidentally, that's when we think Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, right? Let me run through a few more things here. Um, it, it, it does get better. <laughs> um, okay, so back, you guys can follow along with my notes here. Back with uh, Tal Nimrin, same thing. Lots of pottery from the Middle Bronze Age. Nothing from the Late Bronze Age. Very similar to the Tel al Hamam, a.k.a. Uh, Gomorrah on the left, Sodom on the right. Got him, got, my goodness. Sodom was the big one, Tel al Hamam. I obviously don't speak Arabic. Um, so what they were able to tell was this was an extremely thriving walled city, right? This was one of the biggest cities in the area because it was fertile. It had lots of water. It had lots of vegetation. And most importantly, it had that military advantage. They were up on top of this mountain and nobody could climb it. When they, when they started excavating around, what they could tell was that there were mud-shaped bricks all the way up the side of this thing like a pyramid. Basically, it was a city on a pyramid that people couldn't mount it. It was un impenetrable. Right? When you see the castles and stuff like that in England, a lot of times they're on little tiny hills, nothing like what I imagine this to be, but that's how the castles were able to survive. They had the height advantage, and that's what this had. It had the height advantage, right? They didn't have predator drones back then for somebody to get on top like we do now. Uh, they just had guys with sticks and spears that couldn't climb the walls of their city, right? Again, it had height. It was central in the middle of the valley. He talked about it looking like that steamship in the middle of these fields. It had lots of water. It was very fertile. And then the question is, why was it abandoned for so long? Estimated somewhere between 500 and 700 years, right? Based on the, what, he could, what he could dig up, right? And so back to the idea before. 
We thought that Sodom and Gomorrah was in the bottom side of the Dead Sea and the volcanoes were coming up and that's what swallowed these cities, right? But we have volcanoes elsewhere. I mentioned Pompeii a minute ago, right? We've had meteor strikes elsewhere on the planet. These places aren't abandoned for 500 and 700 years in, in history, right? So what was special about this place that made people stay away from it? Again, this is the most advantageous location in the entire Jordan Valley. There's cities and people everywhere constantly at war, constantly trying to kill each other. Why would you not take the big hill, right? Who's going to avoid the big hill? So that was the question now, right? Why was this place abandoned, essentially? Um, again, that layer of ash, it varied somewhere between 18, and 18 inches and 6 feet, kind of clear across. It was filled with lots of different things. Wood, bricks, plaster, cobblestone, as in like walkway cobblestone, different clearly chiseled pieces of rock that were, were, were utilized as building structure pieces and components, um, pottery again. But the interesting part was what they, they have what's called the gravity effect in archaeology. There's a pretty specific way that things are buried because they just fall down with gravity, right? Things on the floor are going to end up at the bottom and then stuff piles on top of that and piles on top of that. And usually the wood's on top, the pottery's in the middle and the rocks are on the bottom, right? Because the rocks aren't going to fall through the ceiling. The rocks are the floor. Right? And typically in archaeology, that's how things are organized. What was interesting is he said that it looked like this stuff was thrown in a blender, in this ash layer. Right, The wood was on the bottom, the pottery is here. There was no organization to it whatsoever. It was just like everything exploded and got thrown in a blender like guacamole. Um, interesting reference through history. The Egyptians called this area, they, they used the word Abel which I thought was interesting. I don't know if that's a reference to the tragedy of the Old Testament, but the word Abel in, in Egyptian, uh, to the best of my understanding, is an idea of sorrow and grief and loss and, and, and unnatural destruction, right? Just like, uh, again, parallels probably in my own mind don't, don't line up, but it, uh, for, I think about Cain and Abel, right? Abel died way before he was, should have. Um, this area throughout the Bible, even by Jesus in the New Testament, but uh, he, he made point to these different areas in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Zephaniah, Amos, Zechariah, all talk about the Jordanian Valley as the ultimate horror and about a place that essentially should be avoided, right? And so he's using these ideas to back up the idea of why it was abandoned for so long. Right, this was a smoldering heap of destruction that nobody wanted anything to do with, right? God, he, he, it is scorched earth. Quite literally, the one place, that's where that saying comes from. Uh, God didn't want anybody else going back around this place. <clears throat> so that kind of elaborates and explains our five to 700 year gap, right? Why was nobody living in either one of these cities, right? Not, it's weird that it happened once in the Tel al Hamam, aka Sodom, but it also happened in, in one right beside it, this Tel Nimri, right? Why did it happen twice? That's again his explanation. Now let me get into the one I find to be the most interesting and the most profound piece that I read from this whole chapter, all right? You guys can hopefully get as much out of it as I did. They were digging for a little while, and uh, I think he had a grad student working for him, and she dug up this little piece, and it was green glass, right? And instantly, this is how smart this guy is, and I know nothing about this, so it wouldn't mean anything to me, but he, he said, we're going home. Pack it in. We're done. Because green glass, the technology for that was A, Islamic, B, not developed until 600 AD, 2,000 years after Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, we found this. This isn't right. This isn't Sodom. Well, this is all for naught. We've been doing this for 20 years, and here we are. So what happened was uh, she flipped it over, and it was pottery on the other side. And, he, and he's really good at identifying pottery. He said, wait a minute. This side, that's, the, that's what we're looking at. That's the 1700 AD stuff. This line's right back up with Sodom. So why is it uh, potentially, you know, middle bronze? It wouldn't be Israelite because there weren't Israelites yet, right? We're still talking about before uh, Isaac, Jacob, and so on and so forth, right? But that, that area in time, 1700 uh, BC people pottery, right? Clearly it's that, that stage of pottery. Why is it Islamic 600 AD glass on the other side? So another guy working with him, he was a, he was a, a, a PhD as well, and he's ex-military, right? And he, he would have been really young, but he was in on the Manhattan Project, right? Out, uh, again, ironically, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, where this guy's from. And he said, uh, that's Trinitite, based off the Trinity Project, which, if, if that doesn't ring a bell, would be the atomic bombs that we tested, 
back in, in, in the desert, right? In, in, in the Southwest. And they're like, how can this be Trinitite? You know, we've only had atomic bombs for a hundred years. And how is this buried in the middle of, of uh, the desert out here in, in, in this Jordanian Valley on top of this mound? Um, and it looked just like that Trinitite quote unquote glass that was formed by the Oppenheimer project or the nuclear bomb testing that they had back in the Southwest. So what did they do about it? So they took that little piece of glass, they took it back to the USA, they took it to a lab, right? And the tech, before they even talked to her, they showed it to her, they didn't say anything. She said, that's a neat piece of Trinitite you got there. So she thought the same thing that the other guy thought. This is a piece of nuclear glass, essentially. And what they found was that the glass Unlike how the Islamic glass pottery was made, the glass was not melted and dripped onto the pottery. The pottery itself had transformed into glass. It was superheated to the point that, just like we talked about when lightning hits sand, it turns into glass, the same idea. This pottery had been heated to the point to where it had turned to glass on one side. So this one single piece of material, not glass stuck to pottery, but one solid piece was half glass, half pottery, right? And they've, this has kind of happened before um, in, in situations of places that burned down that had lots of fuel, right? So a piece of pottery that was in a building that burned, the building was full of oil. So something burned really hot, right? They've seen that before, but it really didn't line up with that much. So what they did is they used an electron microscope, which is a really complex piece of equipment. And they were able to tell that that glass not only was part of the pottery and not only superficial, an eighth inch of that pottery had turned to glass, right? And in order for that to happen, it, we're talking molecular change. We're talking about heat that we've only seen one time on this planet, and it's only been within the last hundred years, right? To our record, right? But if we look back, we you know something that might be kind of similar to a nuclear blast. Um, again, th there's only there. I'm referencing, you know, God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, obviously. But there is one other idea of when this could have happened. And, and this has been recorded a few times. And fortunately, the last time it happened, it happened in 1908. Um, and it happened in Siberia. So nobody was killed. But this is called an intense airburst event. Okay. Intense airburst event. So what happened is a meteor came through the, uh, the um, atmosphere, exploded, and essentially wiped out a thousand square miles of forest. That's what kind of forest we're talking about here, right? And they said it was so and so bright, so intense that it lit up all of Asia and Europe for three days. They said people were reading the newspaper in the street in London for three days after this happened. So that's the type of 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 power we're talking about. And that power, not only I keep rep representing or, or referencing rather nuclear weapons, that power is a thousand times the strength of the bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. Right. So we're, we're talking super nuclear at this point. So looking back, the one reference we have to what happened there, right, because obviously Lot didn't talk about it because he wasn't allowed to turn around. His wife didn't have anything to say about it because she didn't make it out very well. But Abraham talked about the smoke that he saw from 40 miles away. Right. So we're talking, looking over the hill here at Wheeling and you see a chimney worth of fire smoke coming up over the hill. Right. That would be. I would be freaking out. We walk into the church and we see a nuclear bomb dropped on Wheeling down the hill. That's the type of power that we're talking about here. Um, one last thing, much less impressive than that one. That's the most impressive for me. Uh, he actually, in 2012, not that long ago, and a few more things in 2019. So we're talking really recently, just a couple of years ago. Um, he dug up the gate to the city of Sodom. And using the idea from the way that the gates were described back in Genesis, he knew. Um, about where it should be, because it was reference to the city, the city gate, the part that Lot was in and where the angels came in. But he also knew what it was supposed to look like, right? So he found four gigantic towers, turrets, uh, with a six-foot door in the middle, exactly the gate where Lot's at. Um, and this, to this day, even though, you know, I feel like we all should have heard about it by now, it's probably been squandered and squashed a little bit, is noted as one of, if not the most significant archaeological finding of today because we know what it is. And we have reference of what it is. You know, we're not just digging up this old random castle from who knows when. We're talking 5,000 years ago, a long, long, long time ago. When we talk about, you know, the Middle Ages, like that was a long time ago. You know, 1400, we talk about Christopher Columbus in 1600. 1700, the beginning of our country, we talk about that being a long time ago. We're talking about 10 times older than that. This is really, really far back. 
Um, and the, the one take home I want to have here, if, if you want to call this my invitation <laughs> for my little presentation here, um, Dr. Collins only found this because he took the Bible seriously. He was very diligent in the way that he read Genesis and the way that he performed his, his earthly job, right? Um, he knew that Abraham could see it from miles away. He knew round about where Abraham stayed, right? Because we have records of where Lot and Abraham, Abram at this time, were traveling. Um, we knew that Sodom and Gomorrah should have been and pretty much were the largest cities in this circular plain, right? The flat bread. Um, and he knew that the land would have had to have been barren for a long time. So that was where the first two markers he found. The Tel Nimrin and Tel El Hamam both had about 500 year gaps where nobody lived there, right? And that's because God wiped them flat. He, he, he not only killed everything that was there, he made it stay that way for a long, long time, like nothing else that happens on our planet. Um, and that's uh, a pretty immense show of God's power, which has only recently been discovered. Um, so that's what I have for everybody. And here we are. We've got about three or four minutes left. So that, that worked out pretty good. Um, okay, we're good to go. All right, everybody take a water break and uh, we'll uh, let everybody else finish out their classes. No, oh, well, before I, I should start here, does anybody want to talk about this? Does anybody have any questions? This isn't a sermon. This is Bible study. So this is good. Go ahead, Judy. From the fire from the sky. Exactly. And they said the only way that that could have happened uh, in nature that we have in record, right? We kind of have the idea from the nuclear bombs, but when it happened naturally was that intense airburst event that happened in Russia back in the early uh, 1900s, right? And, and from what our, it's just kind of hearsay at this point because the records aren't that good. And nobody lived there. It happened in Siberia, right? The middle of nowhere, essentially Russia's version of the desert. Um, nobody was around to get killed, thankfully. The one part I didn't mention was uh, people 100 miles away in surrounding cities got knocked down. That's how bad the shockwave was from this, this meteor that exploded. That's how bad the shockwave was from 100 miles away. It was enough to knock people off their feet. Um, and then again, the, the light was so bright that all of Europe, all of Asia was lit up to the point where people could read newspapers for three whole days. Um, this is, you know, modern era, the best recorded idea of this happening, right? That doesn't mean that it's never happened since God created an Adam and Eve, but to the best of our understanding and recording of, of knowledge and what's happened in the world with modern history, that's the only thing we have to compare it to. And that's what it would have taken to turn that pottery to glass in the way that it did, um, other than, you know, man-made super kilns or something like that. You know, the heat of a 10,000 Hiroshima bombs is the way you put it in the book. Good question. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yes. So to the best of uh, what he could understand and what I can take out of Genesis here, I don't think Abraham moved very much because it says he just kind of stayed in Canaan, right? And Canaan's just kind of our loose understanding for what modern day Israel is. And we talk about Canaan a lot. And we talk about Jericho, right? So we know he's somewhere close. We know that Jericho was in there and we talk about Joshua marching around. And so it does kind of reference the, the right area from all the rest of the biblical stories that we know. Um, from, from what I understand in the book, Essentially, they stood on top of this mountain, looked, Lot said, that looks good, I'm going down there, and Abraham kind of stayed, right? So this, this is a nice positional map, but one before, uh, topographical, I think Abraham was up here on top of this mountain somewhere. In Jericho, you can see this is a lot less mountainous, I mean, obviously there's a couple kind of rippling through there, but right there where the sea is, and right where the dot of the eye is, are Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom being the sea, Gomorrah being the dot of the eye. And from on top of this mountain, Abraham was able to see the chimney of fire. And that was the only place positionally that he really could have seen that, right? Everywhere else, he's below the mountain, and there's no direct line of sight, right? So on top of the mountain, he could look straight across the mountain range to the south. He could look straight across the mountain range to the, to the north. And he could look down into the valley to the east, right? Obviously, he could have looked west too. But if he was any further to the west, then that mountain range comes in between him. He's down on the flats of the Mediterranean Sea, and he wouldn't have been able to see the fire because it's on the wrong side of the mountain range. It's like standing in Colorado and trying to see California. You can't because the Rockies are in between. Great question. What else? Go ahead, Gary. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, yeah, that would put him kind of in the right area, right? Because he stayed around Jerusalem. Because Bethel and Ai are, aren't that far from Jerusalem. He kind of stayed up on top of the mountain. So I'm, I'm not going to argue with you. That, that lines up with me. Yeah, you can do one next week. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really it's complicated, but it's extremely compelling if you care to dig into it. Anybody else have a last minute question for they come back out? Absolutely. Thank you all for listening. It's uh, yeah, interesting to say the least. All right, very good. Thank you all. So we will pick up <laughs> back in Jude, which is kind of what we talked about tonight um, on Sunday, and we'll probably get through the questions on Sunday as well. So we'll just finish out this lesson. And I think my dad will be back to, to flagship most of that. Thank you, everyone.